when I did uh, philosophy and undergraduate years at Potchefstroom University, former you know, in, in, in NWU, it was interesting that for our history of philosophy, uh, we had these handbooks. The first two years of philosophy was all about the history, and all the periods were grouped together. Uh, there was the age of belief, the medieval times, then the age of reason, you know, Descartes, and so on. Then the age of enlightenment, Rousseau, Kant, and so on. I forget what the age of the 20th century was. Um, but I think we live in the age of evaluations. And uh, this is not just me saying that, because in 1993, Michael Power wrote this famous book called The Ordered Society. And some of you will know it, especially those who come from public administration political science, that since the late 1980s, uh, we've had a whole change uh, towards uh, new public management, where because of the financial crashes in the 1980s, people like Thatcher and Reagan, Reagan coming into power, they had to come down very hard on public enterprise, the public entities, government sectors, to be more accountable for expenditure. And they basically took over business sector rules about auditing and, uh, and assessing performance according to scorecards and so on. Kaplan wrote his famous thing, uh, uh, paper uh, on the uh, scorecard, uh, balance scorecard in the late 80s. And in the 1990s, um, and new public management, or some of you would call it managerialism, hit the university sector. Uh, I still remember when I came to Stellenbosch in 1995, uh, you know, uh, we didn't have at this university, as far as I can recall, a performance appraisal of culture before the 1998-99. The first four years were bliss. <laughs> <laughs> and then suddenly, uh, I think it was Isaac von der Merwe said, now you want, everyone has to be appraised. I say, why? You know, it's, you know, it comes from the top. And so, um, and, well, we did it reluctantly. And increasingly over the years, I think we do it more reluctantly. But um, so what's happened is that my own uh, background from being a philosopher and has ended up being a cytometrician, bibliometrician, um, is, is, is another story. But it means that I think uh, we look critically at metrics. And we have to look critically at indicators and metrics. There's a very famous report now that you should really read. They call the Metric Tide in 2015, uh, which shows the, the upsurge in um, performance appraisals. Even the UK RAE, Research Assessment Exercise, only started in 86. So we're, looking, we're talking about the last 35, 40 years of this evaluation culture. That's why I call it the age of evaluation, which has got both good points and bad points, as I want to try to show today. And even 10 years before that, <laughs> there was this famous uh, article in the Chronicle of Higher Education. The title was The Number That Is Devouring Science. And the number is the journal impact factor. And it was a very critical one. And then, of course, what happened, as usually happens, the people in the diff different domains started res responding critically to that. And we had the Leiden Manifesto uh, in, in 2018 which is a declaration of 12 principles. There's a link, you can read it. And it's now all about responsible metrics and assessment. However, in a certain sense, um, the whole point about the Leiden Manifesto, the DORA Declaration, as some of you know, in San Francisco, which was again a statement against the um, inadvised use of, use of the general impact factor, despite all of these well-documented evidence that you have to be very careful how you use these metrics. Um, my sense is that we live in an age, not just at this university, not even in this country only, but across the globe, where universities, uh, university management and HODs and deans, and then everyone becomes complicit in are obsessed with age index scores, general impact factors. In this country, we have the NRF ratings which I won't say anything about, Tarina, because my view on that is very well known. I want to show you a slide that I came across a few years ago when I did it in Darba at UCT. This is very funny. Uh, I was looking, so it's called the periodic table of scientometric indicators. I hope you can see at the back. I think I counted it. It was something like 140 or 160. All the little blue blocks at the bo bottom are different calculations of the H index. You thought there's one H index, or maybe two or three. 
No, they are three times whatever, 15, 45. All the yellow ones are the standard indicators, journal impact factors, citation rates, and so on. So these people did this very nice thing to show if you, if you thought that we are uh, you know, exaggerating, and then the, the green ones are altmetric indicators. This is the stuff about how science is reflected in the social media, the number of tweets that Jonathan Jansen gets, and then calls us and says, what do you think I should say? I said, switch, close your bloody Twitter account. <laughs> So, um, so the, the, the thing is that uh, there has been this <laughs> proliferation of stuff. So what I'll talk about today, and I'll probably have to skip slides, and you must tell me, give me an indication when I should stop, because if I get on this topic, then, you know. Um, the fact that many of these criticisms of these in metrics that I've mentioned are in fact valid, let me just point from a bibliometric point of view, and biometrics have become a very mature field over the last 30 years. There's no question, if you speak to any bibliometrician, if you look at the publications in the top journals, it has been shown over and over again <coughs> that the H index is a very, very fragile and probably inappropriate indicator. That the journal impact factor, its misuse is when people think that it says something about the author and not the journal. So they say, oh, I. I published in a high impact journal, so my paper probably also had high impact. No, no, that's a category mistake in philosophy because the journal impact factor is a journal level metric. Your article is an article level thing. You need to look at the citations to your article. You can publish in a high impact journal and get zero citations. So the point is that we know all of this in bibliometrics and we tell people that, and despite all of this, I, I really shudder when I sit in meetings uh, for promotions and NRF meetings uh, when the chair says, OK, here are the three candidates for appointment or promotions. Let's start by looking at the age index course or the journal impact factors in which they publish. And then when I say, really, are you serious? Are you so obsessed with a single number capturing the value and merit of this candidate, you know, that you can't do a proper interview and look at their CV in a justified manner. But this does not mean, you must understand me, that I think that we must stop evaluating the worth, the merit, the relevance or impact of research for the simple reason that we're working with public money in many cases. There's the demand of public accountability, transparency and value for money. We live at a time where there's huge competition for resources, for funding in this country. Our expenditure on R&D as a percentage of GDP has gone down. It's now the same level as it was in 1994, 0.6% of GDP. The NRF last year received 30,000 applications for honours masters and PhD students and could only fund 50% of that because of a 25% cut to its budget. And then we have the National Skills Fund, which is being investigated, and NSFAS that is being investigated. So we live in a, in a situation where higher education must show its worth, and it's not so difficult to do it, but it's not the, it, it is not the case that you can show your worth and merit only through metrics. There are other ways to do that. So what I'll talk about is what are the rules of credible and responsible research assessment? And here again, most, most of you are scientists, and I use the word scientist in a very broad sense, uh, even include theology and philosophy uh, under that definition, uh, because uh, I have to. <laughs> uh, yeah, surely, you know, the mother discipline philosophy, I think, should count as a scientific endeavor. Uh, and the point is that um, pretty much everyone who's involved, at least in empirical research, knows the rules of scientific measurement you know that you, your, your measurements are only as good as your data. You know that when you compare things with each other units of analysis, you must compare apples with apples. You know that you have to understand that there are limitations to small samples of anything for generalizability. You know that when you look at the distribution of cases in your study, that you must watch out for skewed distributions. These things apply to bibliometrics as well. So bibliometrics is a form of scientific measurement, but its object are scientific publications and citations and so on. So it should actually resonate with you when I say to you, just apply the basic principles that you use in scientific measurement and don't think that 
you know, their roles are different in the field of bibliometrics. So I'll present a few examples of themes. Some will be more provocative than others. Um, and, uh, 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 and then I'll talk about, I'm going to try to do two things. I'm, I'm going to try and present you some new data. There are really three slides in here, which I have to delete after the session, uh, Tarina, because it presents data from, which I have from DHUT about Stellenbosch's performance for 2021. And Chief Madibizela will kill me uh, if he comes next week and know that I've shared it. So I'm telling you, but you didn't hear it here. <laughs> and I'll show you, but I'll take it out of the slide because we'll only finalize. We're working together with DHUT to finalize the subsidy units for the system next week. And most of the metrics that I discuss here are based on relatively large samples of cases. And uh, what we always encourage is that you use metrics together with peer review. OK, so um, I think it was in 2005, just after the Shanghai rankings um, appeared, that Ton Van Ran, um, who was the director of the Bibliometric Center at Leiden, wrote a, a famous article about the Shanghai rankings. And, he called, and that was just after that movie by Sharon Stone and Douglas, and he called it the fatal attraction. <laughs> And he basically was saying the Chinese have set up Shanghai rankings just to serve the Chinese aspirations to become a major scientific notion, nation. And you have to understand the Shanghai ranking or ARWU have six indicators, which are completely irrelevant to the South, most of them. Nobel laureates, Nobel alumni for the South, we don't have a chance. And basically, it was, uh, it's the, the worst ranking of all of them. The other two tastes and QSS are not much better. The only two rankings which I take a bit of note of is the Leiden Impact Radic Ranking and the Euro Diversity Multi Rank. But the three ones that get the highest profile, Times, QSS, and um, so called Shanghai, um, their only benefit is to the publishers, the owners of those rankings. It has very little benefit to us. So I thought I called about the seductive attraction of the single number, and the single number is a ranking. So, which is the top university in the country? Of course it's UCT. The rankings tell us that. <laughs> yeah, two weeks ago, this comes from the UCT website. First page, literally cut and paste. The University of Cape Town climbed 23 paces, retained its top spot in the rankings. The university is 160 globally and up from 183. And then Geti says, we are deeply proud of our academics and the wider UCT community for the art and excellent work that they've done and competes globally and so on. And of course, uh, no mention made of the other dynamics at the university. So, um, <laughs> but it's, of course it's the top university. But that's not true if you look at the DHUT's unofficial rankings. So you say, what the heck am I talking about? Since when has the DHUT published rankings? Well, in their annual sector reports, I'm going to show you the tables that they produce are, in fact, rankings. And there are two rankings which are based on normalized indicators. And uh, the, the first one is uh, uh, the, 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 the per capita publication output. As you know, under the DHUT subsidy system, universities get subsidy for four publication types, journal articles, book, books, book chapters, and conf published conference proceedings. So there's an there's a, a index, if you wish, or a composite score, which they calculate, they add that up for every university, divided by the headcount of the academic staff, academic, academic being instructional research staff, and then rank the universities according to that. Then the second one, because remember, under the subsidy system formula, there are two other things that we get rewarded for, the number of research masters and PhD graduates that we produce. Now you have six indicators, if you add those to the first four. That's the same number as times. But they make sense, these indicators, because they're within the same system. If you add the other two and you give a weight of three to a doctoral graduate, you get what we call the weighted research output, because it's weighted by three, and it's normalized, again, divided by stuff. So there are, in fact, two rankings. Of course, the department will absolutely deny that they're publishing rankings, because the last thing that they want to get involved is in any debate about their rankings versus other rankings. But they are public uh, property. You can download these reports, literally, from their website. 
So I'm showing you the data for 2020 because 2021 hasn't believed, been released. So on the first ranking, the per capita article output, UCT is ranked fifth in the country. Stellenbosch, third. UKZ in top. UKZ in top on both. Come back to that. On the second ranking, the one that includes the master, UCT is ranked fourth. Stellenbosch, second. So this is how it's calculated. I've just shown you the. So let me show you. I hope you can read at the back. I'll read for you a little bit. So this is for 2020. So what happened is you have UKZN, uh, the headcount of permanent staff they get from the HEMIS data, the data the university submitted. And the UKZN claimed, and I put that in inverted commas for the moment, that they have 1,201 uh, permanent instructional and research staff. And they produced 2,402.387 subsidy units. That's combining articles, conferences, books. If you divide 2,402 by 1,200, you get the per capita 2.1. So it literally means that on average, every academic publishes about two papers per year. Simple to understand. UJ, there's another case. University of Johannesburg, we are watching them closely <laughs> because we know that they've been gaming the conference proceedings. We know that there are some other, let me just call them questionable practices at the university. They say they've got 1,266 permanent staff, produced 2,305, 1.83. So Stellenbosch, yes, we have 1,198. Ian can confirm that. And we produced two. So we had 1.82. On this ranking, UCT last year sat at 1.63. That's number five in the country. You know, then followed WITS, Rhodes, Free State. And there's this kind of belief that all, should stri all universities should strive that at least the average academic produces one paper per year. So at 1.1, you see we cut the point, and then you get to Northwest University, and in fact, the only university of technology because of a, you know, a very efficient uh, ex-deputy uh, vice chancellor. <laughs> uh, and I did the report for her before she left. Uh, DUT is now the highest ranked university of technology. So that, uh, I had to show that. So this is the first. <laughs> This is the first ranking. Look at the second one. The second one now adds the number of research masters, then the doctoral graduates divide, multiplied by three. So when you see UKZN has produced 1,461, no, divided by three. So it's somewhere in the region of about 470 or whatever PhDs. Uh, and so what happens here is that now the scores are higher. You've got more indicators. UKZN on this ranking, again, top. Remember, the headcount stays the same, 1,200, the, uh, uh, the, the, the denominator stays the same. It's just the number of, above the line that changes. 3.88 highs, followed by Pretoria, Witz, then Stellenbosch ranked fourth, then you see T fifth. So which of these rankings do we believe? You know. So when people say to me, think of a time, it's, in a certain sense, it's a nonsensical question you have to say. It's like I look at my labor, neighborhood when my wife said, drags me along to come and walk with the dogs, and she says, that's the best house in the neighborhood. And I say, what are your criteria? You know, <laughs> you know there is uh, Arnold Schoenwinkel's house, there's Stan, the Placis house. I live in a very good neighborhood. Well, you know, ex <laughs> <laughs> Gerard Lubber, all the ex, ex top deans and so on. But um, so what does it mean to say this is the best university? Because you're trying to reduce the complexity of an institution to a single number, a rank. But I'll tell you, this is the story gets a little bit more interesting. So should we trust the DHET data on the HEMAS data now? Well, you should, in a, in a certain sense, both about the, the nominator, the denominator that appears above the line, the number of publications, because how the system works is that you make your submissions, the Tarina and the team verifies every submission. Uh, there's internal auditing. So when we submit X number of units to the department for subsidy, we believe that's true. And uh, the same with the HEMAS data, the staff go through our HEMAS office. So the problem is with the numerator, what we've shown in, over the last four, five, six years at Crest is through various studies at ASAF and so on, is that people can manipulate that number. They can game the system. 
We first showed that in 2017 with the number of predatory publishers. They were counted for subsidy, over 300 that came to 30 million, no, 3,000 that came to 300 million that was paid out over a six year period for articles in predatory publishing, publish uh, journals. Now I can tell you two, three years ago, we found that the University of Johannesburg was gaming the conference proceedings to the extent that there was an internal investigation. How do you justify that you sent five people to a conference in Morocco who gave 60 papers in two days, you know? And some of those sessions overlapped. So we, let, we went to that level and said, this is rubbish data. You cannot get away with this. And unfortunately, it's people in certain disciplines. Now we see that there are numbers of books that we don't trust. You see, when we look like you do, when you look at the trend in your data, you look at spikes or declines. If there's a fairly clear incremental increase or decline, then you start to believe it. But if something suddenly goes up, you have to ask yourself, what is the underlying? It's like Fort Hare. In one year, three, four years ago, for six, seven years, they produced 60, 70 PhDs, Fort Hare. And then about three years ago, they produced 130. Now, how does Fort Hare get, with all due respect, to double its doctoral output in one year? Internal investigations showed hmm, some problems there with some supervisors just you know, getting the PhDs through. So don't believe for the moment that we trust. And let me just also say to the credit of the DHT and Chief Mabizela, he, has, he is a very astute person and he knows that we have to, to make sure that there's better control about the numerator. But the denominator, well, the number of staff, that cannot be wrong. No, that's humorous because it affects the granting. So I'll show you something. So this is now what UKZN showed and UP the last for this year. UKZN, 1,200 staff, Pretoria, 1183, Stellenbosch, 1198. So I think by myself, hmm, Stellenbosch, 1198, how many students do we have? Um, UKZN, 1,200, about the same. How many students do they have? Can you get away with? So let me show you this. So I took just four universities. If you cannot read it, I'll show you. Stellenbosch staff, in the last 11 years, have gone from 921 to 1198. That's a compound annual growth rate of 2.6%. Our students have gone from 27,000 to 30,000. That's the EMS data, of course. UCT, very much the same, by the way. Stellenbosch UCT, very similar trends. Gone from 900 to 1100. I don't really question the UCT data. UCT, UKZN, its students increase from 41,000 to 47,000. At the same time, their staff declined from 1,400 to 1,200. How, how does the university con re retain quality of teaching? That's the big question now. That's maybe under indicate. When you have 6,000 more students and 200 less staff. And Pretoria, uh, they started at 57,000 and they reduced to 51,000. But here's the thing that no one believes. In two, 2010, they said they had 1,699 staff, 1,700. And then just the next year, in 2011, they submitted to the DHET. Now we made a calculating error. We actually only have 1,280 staff, 400 less from one year to another. And what was the calculating error? They said, well, we counted people who are really on contracts as permanent staff. Seriously? You know? So what I thought I would do, and so by the way, you see now, by the way, this is now the student-staff ratio. At the bottom here, you see St St Stellenbosch is about 25 to 1 st staff to students. I know you're comparing a little bit apples and pears. And, and UCT is the gray line is, uh, we're about the same. We are at, uh, at 30 to 1, we're now at 26 to, to 1 students to staff and UCT. That, that, to my mind, is a healthy ratio. Look at where uh, uh, UP is, 44 1 students per staff member because of these other numbers and UKZN at 39 to 1. So I thought, that's when I was a bit in a bad mood. So I said, <laughs> I, hypothetically, let's give all these universities the same ratio of 30 to 1. <coughs> we add five more and we come in. And so, uh, and then uh, I didn't adjust tell about the UCT because we're already 25. So I adjusted UKZN from 44 to 1 and said, if you have so many students, and you take three, what would be your staff really? If it's just 30 to 1, then KZN would, come, would go up their staff, not from 1,200 to 1,500. 
and Pretoria to 1,400. And what happens to the ranking? You see? Because now the, the nominator, the denominator has, has increased. So, the, so basically, if you, and, and it is very difficult to get a definitive answer from the department about these should be internally verified audited numbers because they affect the parliamentary grant. So I can tell you that um, even this internal unofficial ranking, which showed that the top four universities are all around three, and if we really are a bit mutzvillig, then we could say that Stellenbosch on this one is actually the top university in the country. <laughs> okay, so, and then there's the other thing. Who really produces these publications? Stellenbosch produces about last year uh, 22,100 publications. So when you divide your publications by your academic staff, you're working on the assumption it's the staff that produce the publications. But we know that's not true. First of all, it's not all the staff to begin with. There are some staff, like Leslie, who can't stop publishing. I hate you. <laughs> you know, he's so prolific, uh, even for an old guy. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, he looks like, makes us look bad. You should really cut back. And, so the point is that, um, you, you know, out of the 1,200 staff, there's one law in bibliometrics, it's one of the few laws in social sciences called Lotka's law, which is a form of a power law, which just basically says, no, no, no. If you have 1,200 people in a system, whether it's a university or a country, not everyone is going to make an equal contribution. There will be, Lotka's law says, and this is, by the way, I'm using this with real data, which I did for a study in the past. So I took four universities, Vespertoria, UKZ, and UCT, and I basically looked at the top bottom, the, the percentage of all, the top 10% of authors is the first, then the next 20%, then the next 20%, then 20%, but then 20%, the dot, bottom 10%. And what you perceive is that the top 10% of the most productive people at the university produces between 55 and 60% of the university's output. Those are your product, those are your, those are your stars. Then the next 20% adds another 25%. So suddenly what you see is that one third of your staff on this one produces, what, 60 plus 25, 85%. Now again, this is, uh, I keep on just telling you how critical you have to be. We know that not every author that's on this paper is a staff member. They are now PhDs publishing, master students, postdocs, and let's not talk about visiting professors because there's a big issue at the moment in the country and the D8 is looking at this, because some universities, the biggest gaming that we now think is universities appointing someone, not formally, according to the HUT, if you appoint someone as a visiting professor or a research fellow, it has to be formally uh, completed through your HR, appointed to the Senate. Some people say here Professor X from Bristol came for a week and he's agreed to put his name on all his publications, our university. And that thing, the gaming of affiliations, is now huge. We've identified out of 2021 submissions of 66,000, about 3,000 papers, where we think that the name of the author there has no real strong link with that university. And this is just chasing the money. And so you can see why you have to look at all of these numbers and rankings. So even this unofficial ranking uh, you know, and that's why Crest has no real interest in producing rankings. We would rather try and sensitize people uh, to the underlying problems. Okay, um, so this is the part which I can share with you now, but cost us a lot of money. And so what we can do at Crest, uh, is we're the only center on the continent, costs us a million rand in licenses to get the individual records from the Web of Science. Uh, going back when? So uh, 65 million records, 1.2 billion citations. This is big science. And, and so basically what we do is we created an integrated database infrastructure and we can do analysis either on SI knowledge base, which is the, you know, the subsidy driven one, or just we use the web of science. Why would you use web of science? For comparative purposes across universities and the world. Because the South African system you know, includes journals which are not in the web of science. So I'm going to show you a few slides and I'll skip a few because uh, I try to anticipate that there might be people from different faculties who might have different interests. Um, and so just to show you, uh, and this is up to date to 2021, 
This is now our articles, the university's articles in the Tom, it's not more the Thomson, it's not called Thomson Reuters anymore, it's Clarivate Analytics. The old ISI, which doesn't exist, please. If someone still thinks there's a thing called the ISI journal, you're about 25 years behind the time. So uh, ISI was bought out uh, by Thomson Reuters, which was bought out by a venture capital firm based in Singapore called Clarivate Analytic. So it's now CA, Web of Science. So what we see here is an interesting thing, and we see that with a lot of universities. So our output in the web of science uh, increased from 380 papers 22 years ago to 3,160. That's a nice, even exponential growth, the, the blue bars. The percentage there, I asked uh, my postdoc, I said, uh, calculate for me what is Stellenbosch's share of the country, this, the, 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 the whole country, that's now the universities and the science council, in the web of science. And that shows that uh, the green line, you have to read it from the right-hand axis, that our share in 20, 2000 was just above 10% and it's just now below 12%. That's not a bad achievement. We, we have increased our output and increased our relative contribution to the country's publication output. You see, but that means that, look, every university has increased its output because they're all chasing the subsidy money. But to increase your output and to make sure, I mean, you could say, yeah, the last four or five years, uh, why are we stagnating? I mean, this is a zero-sum game. I mean, everyone is chasing this. So what I've done here is to take uh, about 10 universities and just to show you uh, this summary, you have the 2,500 articles. Um, even UCT in 2005 only had 683 articles in the web of science. They have gone to 2021 to 3,957. This is order in, uh, ordered in descending order on that column, the third column. And so UCT contributes 14.38% to the country's share based on the web of science data. Now you must remember just this big caveat. It does not include 120 South African journals which are not indexed in the web of science. And in which fields are they mostly? Humanities, social sciences, law, theology, economic management sciences. So the presence of UCT in the web of science, like all of us, is really determined by their publication output in medicine, health sciences, natural science, engineering, and in our case also agricultural sciences, which is doing quite well, actually. So basically, this is the compound average, average growth rate. So Stellenbosch you know, move from 10.26% to 11.6%. So we're the fourth biggest contributor to the country's output. And by now, I include the 26 universities and CSIR, HSSC, ARC, all of this. So again, not a bad uh, uh, achievement. And our growth rate of 20.6% is higher than the top universities above us. So we're on a good trajectory there, OK? So, yeah, I, you can look at the slide at your time time because I, uh, we, we have a system of classification at the first level. We organize it by agriculture, science, engineering, health, humanities, natural science, social science. This classification doesn't uh, correspond 100% with the faculty structures. Let me just point out, that's a very different exercise. But uh, for agriculture sciences, it would be mostly correct. Engineering, it would be mostly correct. But there's an overlap between health sciences and social sciences in some fields, for instance and between natural sciences and uh, engineering. So, um, but basically what you see, perhaps the most worrisome result here is that the humanities, its um, increase, uh, the compound average growth rate is at the bottom, is the lowest for the humanities and arts of 2.1%. And at the other point you have seen agri-sciences doing quite well, it has increased its presence in the web of science. When you increase your presence in the web of science, you increase your likelihood of being cited, which increases your likelihood of ever, if you're interested in getting in the ranking, because most of the rankings are based on the presence in the web of science or scopus. But that's not why, I, to me, this is good that we, we the humanities and arts, um, by the way, is therefore also a, a dependent on the fact that, you know, we have 25 theology journals in this country, 25 law journals in this country, I always say that, and one on physics and one on chemistry and so on. Tells you something about our history, ne? Christlich Afrikaans National, Onerweis, 
I mean, in what country do you have 25 times more theology and law journals than in physics and chemistry and electric engineering? <laughs> so most of those 50 journals are not in the web of science. So they're not counted, and that's why the humanities, do, so law and theology faculties, I cannot do citation analysis for law and theology because their the presence is too limited. But this is, if you, the one that I showed you here is the overall thing, and this is uh, what is good, uh, Nico, is that our medicine and health sciences, if there's a, there's, the correspondence is not 100% with the faculty, but in the field of medicine and health sciences, we have uh, our share in the web of science has increased from 26% to 31%. UCT is still sitting at 46, 47%. Nearly half of all UCT's papers come from the medical faculty. And that, by the way, is the single, I was saying to Sabu last night, that is the single but the most important reason why they get into the rankings. Two reasons. One is, so, so they have two faculties, natural sciences and uh, health sciences, Together, that constitutes about 75, 80% of their output. They have small law, nothing in education to speak of. Humanities, not great. Social sciences, so-so. Economic and management sciences are not known for huge productivity rates. So their presence in the web of science and therefore in the rankings is determined by two things. High share from medicine and health and natural science in the web of science. And these happen to the field to be the fields where there are high citation rates, as I'll show you. So they have a double advantage. And that, that, that we must remember. That, um, so we, and, and I'll show you uh, visually what that means. But this is, this is nice. Uh, yeah, as a person in humanities, uh, it shows that the share has increased in most cases, except, uh, I'm not sure why I have two, the two red lines, one is supposed to be brown, but that was late last night. OK. <laughs> There's an indicator that we like to use called the relative field strength. One, I'm going to skip to that. So what you do when you look at the web of science is that you look at the total output of your university by these main fields, and you compare that with this, the, the total output of the country in the same field. So you, at what proportion each fields make at the university uh, compared to, divided by the proportion it makes to the country. So to explain it, for those of you who didn't uh, do maths at school, we are comparing two proportions. My, my layman's explanation is this. If in my household we spend 20% on food every month, but in the rest of the neighborhood of Dalsuch, the average household spends 30% of their expenditure, then my expenditure is 20% of that 3% is two thirds, is 0.7. I spend less on food than the average household. I'm comparing two ratios. So what you're looking at here is the following. Now, the, the dark, bold, black line in the middle is one. That is the average for any system. Anything above one means that relative to your reference group, in this case the country, we are more active, and a relative, we call it the relative field strength. It was called the activity index, the specialization index. So agriculture sciences, I can see Dani likes this, agriculture sciences, the, 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 blue, the green line was early 2005 to 2011, the, uh, the, sorry, the latest there, and the blue line was the early period. So actually, in agriculture sciences, when you have a score of two, it means that you are twice, you're, you're twice as active, you're twice as strong as you, as, uh, in terms of your, the contribution to the country than any of, you, of the, the, the world, like the country average in this case. We also do it for the world average. But, uh, but now you see social sciences, anything above that uh, bold line, we're doing good in the humanities and arts actually. Although there's a little bit of a strange explanation for that, which you can ask in the Q&A. Natural sciences, we're about on the country average. That means that pretty much the effort that we put in natural sciences is commensurate. With, Engineering, we are not doing as well as we can in terms of relative activity, but we are competing with big engineering faculties. I mean, Vikas and I, we did discuss that. So the thing is that um, South Africa as a country, by the way, that's how its, its engineering profile looks as well. As a country, we are under investing in engineering sciences. Why do you think we're not doing good in innovation? because engineering sciences is one of the key drivers of technology development and innovation. 
And uh, we do this for African countries, and you see that uh, engineering is underrepresented pretty much in every country on the continent except Egypt, Egypt for interesting comparison. So what I did here was to show you, this, it's nice to look at these spider diagrams, and you see UCT. Now you could say they don't have a faculty, agricultural sciences, yes. This is not based on faculty structures. This is fa based on journals, like in food science, for instance, that are linked to the sub subject category agriculture. Even UCT, this comparison engineering, is pretty much where we're sitting. It's at 0.5. Health sciences, they're good. Humanities, social science. Look at UKZN, very good agricultural sciences. They, uh, engineering, you see how badly the South African University is doing in terms of activity and relative field strength in engineering. Vits, there's no presence in agriculture, you can see. Social science is strong. Uh, you would have thought uh, the health science, but we, we're not talking about the absolute volume, remember? We're talking about the proportion of a proportion. And then Pretoria, and then I decided I might as well do some of the smaller universities. UWC is an interesting one. Nothing engineering, nothing agriculture, strong humanities and arts. Uh, that's very interesting. Health sciences on the average, natural sciences on the average. And then free state, yeah, basically um, it's either they work on the farms or they, <laughs> they, read, the, they read the Bible, theology. <laughs> so. I know it's too extreme. I told you I'm going to offend a few disciplines today. Okay, so, so these spider diagrams are interesting because they help us to understand, and this is a point that I made about the rankings. Okay, I, uh, wait, what's the time there? Okay, I'll try to stop in 10. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'll have to skip a few things because, uh, well, there are 60 slides, which is too many anyway. Citation impact, I'll say a few things. We measure citation impact uh, because of citation. What I want to show you, this is probably, arguably, the most important slide which is coming up. I don't know whether the people in this room understand uh, that the, uh, what we do in bibliometrics are two very simple things. It's, and at one level, it's a very simple discipline. We either count publications, different types of documents, uh, we look at ratios and whatever, growth rates, or we count citations to publications. Those are the two things that we do. Now, counting citation, uh, both publication behavior had, differs across fields. Now, humanities publish in books, and uh, life sciences published most in articles, computer science engineering conference. So there are differences in publication behavior. Citation behavior, same thing. The, the citation behavior of scientists in different fields are vastly different. And uh, I've asked, uh, and so basically in some fields, people cite many more. They just simply have larger teams. That's the other thing there. Eh? Remember, in some areas like Global Health Initiative or the CERNs for High Energy Physics, it is nothing strange these days to have a thousand authors on a paper. You won't get that in philosophy, in history and mathematics. No, in philosophy, we know we have the wisdom, wisdom, one article, that's okay, one author. But the point is that if you're just one author, your chances of being cited is so much less. And I'm going to show you the evidence because I asked Yaku, my smart postdoc, I said, go through the whole web of sites, all 65 million records. Give me the average citation rate um, for a two-year and a five-year period for 250 disciplines. I cannot show you 250, but in descending order. So here's what I show you. I took 2016 as the publication year because what we do is, uh, this is now the, the highest, what is called, it's called the citation density. So basically the field in the world where papers get cited on average, remember it's an average, no? there can be outliers from zero to 5,000. But the average is that an average paper in nano size in 2016 would have been cited 11.5 times in the publication year 2016 and the two subsequent years. If you add five years up to 2021, 29 times. So that's the highest in the world. For some reason, I, sometimes people say, yeah, I'm going to publish it. I'm, you know, watch me. I'm going to get 30, 40 citations in the first year or two. No, not unless you manipulate it, which we can talk about. But the point is that look at the fields here at the top that are more than 10. Cell biology, chemistry, energy, uh, energy environmental energy, astronomy. 
So you get up after five years, the average paper in astronomy will have been cited uh, 21 times. And then you go off, you get, you off, you get from, there's also a thing that fast moving fields, nanoscience, get cited more quickly. And by the way, that's why you will see that uh, in some fields like immunology and uh, in some health sciences field, well, because of COVID, people got the papers out, they got the citations. It's called the immediacy index and we can calculate it for you in your field. Then you see oncology, here you start to see the health sciences, infectious diseases, then you go off, and by the time that you get to psychology, which is really the first social science, the average paper gets five citations within two years. That's now already half than the top. Né? And after five years, 50, still half than the top. Now look at the rest, I took, I took it down all the way to history. So basically, business sciences, speak cited three times and then 15 over five years. There is an interesting thing that you see with the social sciences that their accumulation of citations grows slower than in the social science. But mathematics is a field where the average paper in mathematics in the world in 2016 would generate 1.6 citations in two years and 4.3 in five years. This is an average, but this is based on millions of records. So this is not, you know, small samples. And in history, you're lucky if you get one citation in five years. <laughs> Why? Because you write books. And there's no reliable book citation index in the world, by the way. Can I just tell you? The Web of Science has got one. Tales of Few says what? They're talking nonsense. The book citation index is a nightmare. So what I wanted to emphasize, now, why is this important? So when you work in the field of astronomy and astrophysics, and let's say, for argument's sake, you've got the H index that people say, oh, wow, you've got an index of 60. That's fantastic. Ne? 60 would be great. And um, I work in the field of sociology. And sociology gets about a third of the citations. And I get the age index of 20. It's the equivalent, if you normalize by field, for an age index of 60 in astronomy. You see, that is the, I mean, I'm simplifying it, I know, because there's a lot of other things that come into play. One of the big things that come in play is, by paper, you look at the number of authors, the more authors you have, but they tend to be in the top fields. So you may just start to understand why I am skeptical when people throw around H index scores. And there's a web of size H, uh, H index, a Scopus H, and then the Google Scholar H index, index, which is the highest of them all, because it counts everything that they can find on the web. So it's not standardized. So we have to understand, that's one of the reasons and which I would advise the, the directorate and Terina knows that. One thing when you develop a research strategy for a university where you have 10 faculties and you've got 100 and something departments, you cannot have the single monolithic homogeneous strategy for every environment. Your research plan for the philosophy and history department cannot look the same as the one for the people in oncology or in electrical engineering. You are ignoring field differences. And you then, at, you then run the risk, and then if you go further and you apply these metrics in appointments and promotions, it is simply unfair to the people concerned. And that's why I feel so strong about the fact that we must use these things more reality. Okay, so I'm going to skip a lot of things. I, you can read this. These are the, we, you can normalize these citation scores. I show you astronomy, which is high. Geology is lower. So it goes on. Up, uh, we also create these indexes, uh, these uh, indicators, where we look at the number of citations in the top 1% proportion in the world, and then top 5% and so on. Agriculture, good, looking good, 10% uh, of all of the, the of the papers in the top 10% are produced by Stellabos in the world. Health sciences, it's about 12%. Natural sciences, 12% in 2021. We draw nice pictures, but I'm going to go on that. And a research collaboration, we're doing good Stellenbosch. The red line is international collaboration. So 20 years ago, only 30% of our papers produced here had a co-author from a foreign country. It's amazing, 20 years ago. Now it's up to nearly 60%. But uh, what you see is that single author uh, contribution is going down. That's worldwide, only about 8%. And they're all in the humanities, pretty much, and mathematics and so on. 
I've done it for agriculture. You can look at this. Agriculture is interesting. I'm not sure why I chose agriculture all the time, but there's health sciences. Because so uh, national collaboration is sixth, uh, international is uh, outside Africa. Uh, and I didn't just took a specific field. Well, astronomy is one of the highest international, pretty much 90% of all papers in astronomy and astrophysics are with foreign authors. It's because of CERN even, and this big infrastructure. They all, uh, and the signatories to CERN. Then I'll fin finish off, um, Karina, because I do, uh, we have the advantage in SA knowledge base that we capture, and we've been capturing it now for the last 25 years. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the race, in inverted commas, we always want to do that, gender, inverted commas, the country of birth, the year of birth, not in inverted commas, uh, <laughs> that's it, can't change it, um, and uh, uh, academic position, are you a staff member, student, and so on, for every author of every article. Our coverage is like 95% out of 600,000 records uh, since 2005. So I thought, let me show you Stellenbosch, because that's why we're here. If you look at the whole university and the percentage of female authored articles, uh, uh, that's the red line, the red bar, and the green bar is the sector, the other universities. And we're actually doing better than the sector. We're not at 50% or where, whatever the target should be. Mm -hmm. This is not compared to the academic staff composition. These are the publishing authors. Né? So it means that in 2005, we were at the national average where 31% of all papers published in the country were there was a female co-author or author, and 70% men. Now, in the country, it has gone from 31 to 37%, and we've gone from 30 to 40%, 10 percentage point increase. You, I mean, this is moving a tanker, né? because you're talking about staff who retire and whatever. You don't go from 30 to 60. Uh, so this is uh, female authored. And I, did, I thought you might be interested. This is, uh, this is actually based on the faculties. Uh, Tarina mentioned that I'm doing a study. It's not finished. This is preliminary results. The big study is due in January, where we're going to break this down to departmental level. And hopefully, there's a lot of data crunching up to that time and cleaning. But you can see even this 40% uh, for across the system if you look at the right, it's hugely different. The highest presentation, representation of women are in the education faculty, 55%. The lowest are the science faculty and in theology, 16%. We don't have too many female duomenes yet. But you know, these are historical things. You see, I always tell people, by the way, some of this is global trends. No? Don't think that we're that different. If you go and look at religious studies in Germany, how many you know female you know scholars can find there? And the same uh, law is you know is 50-50 female male. Engineering is it's gone. So when I did a study for Vickers, I think that people can say, oh, 19, 20% for female engineering, that's not good enough. No, no. Look at the trend. I mean, look at trends over time. To move from 4% to 20% is a five-fold increase in a traditionally male-dominated field in the world. So that's why you have to interpret these things in context. Don't hit the engineering faculty because they're not at 40 or 50%, because no engineering faculty is there. I mean, rather applaud them. He didn't ask me to do, say that. Applaud, <laughs> applaud them for moving the needle in the right direction. No? This is how we interpret bibliometrics. Now, the slightly not so good news is when we look at race. Now, remember, according to employment equity uh, transformation uh, statistics, when you look at the race of uh, authors, you only look at people with a South African citizenship or with permanent residence. So you keep that in mind. People who are on temporary residence here, they come from Zimbabwe, Ghana, whatever, they are not classified by race. And some people think, oh, Zimbabwe, that means black African. No. If you have a postdoc from Zimbabwe and he or she is on a temporary residence, they're simply not counted according to the Employment Equity Act, and therefore you can't count them for transformation. HEMIS understands this, the NRF understands this in the new funding formula. So what we do here is we basically, we probably underestimate with race the percentage black, black now generic, colored Indian, Asian, and black African. So um, black articles for Stellenbosch, the national picture has increased from 17% black to 49%, and Stellenbosch from 8% to 
Okay, so that again, is this a positive picture in a sense that there's, uh, we're moving the needle in the right direction? Of course it is. Is it sufficient? Of course not. You know? So the point is that this is how you use metrics. You say, we have this, and here's the breakdown now by faculty. So now you're the deans and say, where are we? Education is looking good at 61% black female. But again, engineering 8%, theology 23% black, agriculture. But you have to look at where, again, where were agriculture 20 years ago? 2% black to 14% black, sevenfold increase. So, I mean, you know, we have to be fair in our assessments of this. So, I, my last few slides are really a le a, a, like a lecture. So, I'm not going to take field differences seriously, understand the nature of limitations of a data source, compare apples and apples, we all know, always interpret results in context. And do not work finally on the assumption, my major, that every dimension of research can be quantified. Please do not do, don't think that every aspect of research knowledge production can be captured in a metric. There are qualitative dimensions. The biggest single challenge that we have is on measuring the social impact of research. It's a qualitative variable. And I can tell you there is no, at this point, no standard set of metrics to measure social impact. People have proxy indicators. The best way to measure impact is through narratives to tell case studies, to show what you've done had an impact in the community or in innovation technology. It's narrative stuff, it's qualitative stuff. They tell a story to show that what we did here actually benefited the community. We created jobs, we improved quality of life. It's, you cannot, because of the complexity of the phenomena and the problem of causal attribution, reduce this to a single metric. On that note, I thank you.